Normal for most, most people, their goals would maybe um, want to see success, to build some wealth, and maybe have a little bit of fame. We all like to be liked. We all like to be looked up to. And so that's, that's, that's normal goals. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, once in a while, there's um, a unique human being that seems to come by and they just really, really stand out. Now, I'm reaching way back to like the early 1900s to uh, uh, a man uh, by the name of um, Eric Lindell. And um, interesting man that um, he was a champion, they say, of conviction. A champion of conviction. And so there's a picture here of this guy running. And, and maybe you've uh, seen the movie um, uh, uh, Chariots of Fire all the way back in 1981. It came out true story about this man that uh, was a devout Christian and he wanted to do something for God and just whatever he could do. So I want to use this man and, and I'm probably going to pound this analogy to death, but he really is a unique man. But Church of Fire, that's the music as I preach. You'll recognize it pretty quick. You'll recognize it pretty quick. Okay. Man was born in China to missionary parents. But he was sent to a boarding school when he was six years old. Born in China, but they came back as when he was six, put him in a boarding school, him and his brother, and he didn't see his parents again until he was 12. And that was just for a short time, and then he didn't see him again until he was um, 19 years old. This man, um, Eric, he had uh, gone to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and he earned his uh, bachelor's degree in science, but he was also also a bit of an athlete. And um, he played rugby and is actually part of the Scottish national team. But he was really good at just running track. Now, he was very odd in the way that he ran. When he ran track, he picked his knees way up to his chest uh, and then he would run leaning back and, and his head was tilted back and, and um, you know, his arms were flailing about. Uh, well, he had a very wise coach that didn't work that uniqueness out of him. But he ran, he was very safe, but he ran, he said, for the glory of God. And if he didn't run, he felt I'd be dishonoring God. And so he, so he is a runner, but I want to use him as an analogy, but also talk about another runner in the Bible. But this is the forerunner of Jesus, a man by the name of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, we can read, Jesus began talking about John to the there we go. So Jesus began to talking about John the Baptist to the crowd. What kind of man did you go out in the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No. People with expensive clothes, they live in palaces. He's out in the wilderness. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes. And he's more than a prophet. John is the man whom the scriptures referred when they say, look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived. None is greater than John the Baptist. So what kind of man did you go out to see? What kind of man was this John the Baptist? Well, first of all, we know that he's a man that gave everything he had to the call of God in his life. 
much like this man, Eric, I was uh, just talking about. Whatever he gave himself to, he went great guns uh, blazing into it. When he was at the university in Edinburgh there, um, he joined a group, the Oxford group is what they called it. And he learned about the absolutes. He actually got saved there. And uh, he loved God prior to that, but he really got saved when he went to the university there and joined this group. But there was four absolutes of, um, you know, purity, unselfishness, honesty, and love. And he began to give himself to every single one of those like John the Baptist. Um, he wasn't into this life. This man, Eric, John the Baptist, uh, he wasn't into this world himself. You know, the Bible says as far as clothing, he wore camel skin. What he ate, locusts and wild honey. Now, locust is not the bug. A locust is a bug. But locust is a plant. So he lived on this particular plant and wild honey. He's out in the wilderness. And, and you know what? He wasn't living for this life. He was way out in the, out in the wilderness and uh, forget the fine clothes, forget the earthly palace that I could, you know, work for. Um, you know, my palace is still under construction. When I get there, it'll be ready. That was his whole thinking, John the Baptist. And so he knew he was called to do something specific for God. To run the race, the Bible talks about. To press in and not just run, but to run to win. And so here's this man, John, that just gave himself fully to what God wanted him to do. And he knew, as well as Eric, this man, that God's given me a lane. And I'm going to run in that lane. So he was the man to prepare John the Baptist, to prepare the way for the coming Christ. For Jesus a voice of one crying in the wilderness, the Bible says. And he was a prophet, and yet even more. He was the final prophet before Christ. To prepare the way, to break the ice with people, to go out there in the wilderness and just preach repentance. To take a stand, to break the ice, because people were not living for God. And so John the Baptist, he says, you know what? <laughs> it was going to be hard, but he attacked verbally preaching hard truth you vipers you snakes you know and and he brought it down and the people flocked to hear him people were baptized in the to repent and to begin to do right he prepared the way before christ but he was a man john the baptist of conviction Jesus said, so what did you go out to see when you went out in the wilderness? Did you see a guy like a, like a reed just blowing in the wind? Or did you see an oak standing strong? No, he wasn't a reed blown about by every breath of wind. He was a man of conviction. And he stood for what was right and what was wrong. It cost him. In fact, it cost him dearly. But he had a message for the king in that given area. <clears throat> he said, by the way, you need to repent from what you're doing, he told the king. Not only uh, uh, um, are you doing wrong, but you're doing wickedly wrong. And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But John the Baptist to the common people, he said, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, there's coming judgment. So he was strong, very, very strong. Let me go back to this guy, Eric Lindell. And he uh, um, actually was uh, such a good runner that he made it all the way to the Olympics. He was representing Great Britain in the 1924 Paris Olympics. And he was favored in the world to win the gold medal in the 100-yard dash. The 100, uh, no, 100 meter race. And so he's completely favored. However, before the race, as he's trained his whole life to get there, 
he finds out that the 100 meter race is on Sunday. You know what he did? He says, I'm not running. I refuse to run. That's the day of the Lord. It's a conviction of his. That's the day of the Lord. I'm not running. And this made worldwide headlines. There's a few people that applauded his stance, but most people were just aghast that he would run for Britain. And uh, he was under pressure from all sides. The Olympic Committee, the Prince of Wales, Scotland had never had anyone win a gold medal. This was their chance. But he said, I'm not running. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and uh, they're saying, just bend a little bit. You can still have your God bend a little bit. But he had such a firm conviction. He stood strong and he said, no, not for the sake of my country, not for the sake of anyone. I'm not doing it. I'm not running. You know, John, the Baptist, when he took his stand before the king, he rebuked King Herod. He said, number one, you divorced your wife. Number two, you un unlawfully took your brother's wife. And you're living, this is a mess. So he rebuked the king of that given area. They tried to talk Eric into running. One person came to him and said, look, the Continental Sunday ends at 12 o'clock. So you can run after that. And he said, no, no, my, um, my Sunday is all day. I'm not running. <laughs> they did everything they could to try to make, but he could not be persuaded otherwise. Even John the Baptist, shh, don't attack King Herod. I'm saying what I got to say. Neither of them could be persuaded. You know, let's just stop for a second about that Sabbath day commitment that he held to. You know, our Sabbath day for the Christian is the Lord's day called Sunday. And uh, you know, I'm not being legalistic about this. It's just the basic structure in our life. For Eric, he didn't have to pray about it. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I, God? No, he had a conviction. I don't have to pray about this. I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm not running. And um, I'm going to lay it aside. Nothing's getting in my way. And uh, this stance was for himself. Not for the world. He wasn't doing it for that. It was a stance that he took within himself. And so let's talk about this commitment and conviction that he had. Now, was this for God that he wouldn't do that and go to church on Sunday rather than go run? Was that for, was that for God? Or was that, you know, to keep God's rule? Remember the Sabbath day? Keep it holy. Now, was that for God to keep the Sabbath day holy, or was it to keep him right? I'd say it was the latter. He wasn't legalistic in any way. You read about his life, and I did study his life. He wasn't legalistic in any way. He just had a conviction. I'm not going to fudge because this is for me. It's for me, not for God. This is for me. And I'm keeping God's, God's, and I'm honoring that, that Sabbath day. So, <clears throat> John, the Baptist, you know, he, we read about him today. Everybody in the world that's Christian, and even people that aren't Christian know about John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, we can read it in the Bible today. It's for everyone to, to know. But Jesus made a statement about John. John's in prison. He's about to be killed. But Jesus, as he's talking to the people, he's telling them about John and how strong he was. He wouldn't waver. 
But at the tail end of that, he says, you know what? Among everyone that has born, ever been born, there's been none greater than that man, John the Baptist. None greater. How would you like to have that tagged on you? Nobody born of women better than your name, than who you are. Jesus honored, God honored, John the Baptist and his commitment. Wouldn't be persuaded. Stood for what he knew to be right, even in the face of the king. You know, going back to Eric now, he wouldn't run the hundred. But there was an opening where he could run the 400 on Thursday. And <clears throat> he was at a huge disadvantage because he was inexperienced with that. He wasn't fully trained <laughs> for that. And the distance difference is very different in running and very difficult. For the 400, he wasn't a contender, not even a contender. And then on that day, it turns out that they had back-to-back -back races. Back-to-back, -back, and he'd never ran back-to-back -back races like that. And uh, that interestingly, he improved each time. And then when it came to that particular race, he drew the outside lane, <laughs> which is the worst lane. There's one Ben and, and nobody ever wins in the outside lane. So, you know, he's got literally no chance at the 400 meter. But just before the race, a teammate came up and slipped him a note. And, you know, he pulled it out and he read it. And I read these words. They that honor me, God says in 1 Samuel 2.30, they that honor me, I will honor. Now, here's a man that, uh, and John the Baptist, neither of them said, God, let me be great. God, let me be victorious. And, and neither of them knelt by their bedside and did that. Eric never prayed for God, just help me to win. Now, all he says, God, just be with me. Just help me. He put in the work. He trained hard. And he only wanted, this was his request, God, that you would be glorified somehow by my running. That you would be glorified. That was his prayer. Well, so he ran the 400. And not only did he win the 400 meter and get the gold, he broke the world record, shattered it in his style <laughs> with his head back and his arms and he shattered it. Uh, and actually uh, uh, China in their literature, they'll um, list um, Lindell as uh, China's first Olympic champion because he was born there. <laughs> so, they, so they say that, but you know, one thing else about this man, not only did God honor him, but he was a man of not just conviction, but the way he lived his life was, I just want to know where God wants me to go, what God wants me to do, and show me the lane, and God, I'll run in that lane. I'll give it everything I've got. So here he is now, after that gold medal for Scotland and and uh, England and so on and so he's 22 years old he's got the attention of the entire nation on him he's paraded he's cheered him and uh, it never went to his head you know he shocked the world when he announced just a few months later I'm going to China to be a missionary what gave up everything and he headed out the very next year to be a teacher and to do missionary work in china the fame the fortune the glory well that's great 
And he was even able to speak and even preached in his speaking. And, and uh, But the big thing was that missionary work in China. <laughs> and that was the big thing. It was far more important, something greater than gold. He said, Christ for the world, for the world needs Christ. One man asked him, do you ever regret uh, leaving it all? He made this statement. You know, it's natural to think about that sometimes, but I'm glad I'm doing this present work because my life counts far more at this rather than having a life of glory. My life counts so much more at this. Yeah, and you know, the one word you just threw out again, again was just to surrender to God. What does God want me to do? And surrender to that. And so uh, both John the Baptist and Eric, they had their spiritual disciplines and they had this manner of life where they were unwavering, but both of them were unselfish servants of our God. It cost John imprisonment, the Baptist thrown in jail, and later it cost him his head. King Herod's wife, second wife, had him beheaded. You know, Eric, he did marry a woman by the name of Florence, had two girls, and then when uh, the war hit in 1941, he sent his pregnant wife and two girls to Canada because he could not leave the work that he was doing. So he sent them to Canada for a while. And, and um, in 1944, they put Eric in a Japanese prison camp. Well, he had his basic needs, but really hungry most of the time. And But he began to minister to children that were in the prison that didn't have parents even teenagers well in time just the overwork load and the malnutrition and then of course the brain tumor added to all that and uh, he ended up dying at 43 years old in his Japanese prison camp and they say about him he left such a vacuum that nobody could fill his last words were, it's complete, sir, sir, sir. And he could never finish the word surrender before he died. Not very many like Eric in this world. Not very many like John the Baptist that both of them just lived for the glory of God. They cared about the eternal kingdom rather than this world and their own likes and wants. And, and of course, they both cared about others. But they both laid down their life. But they both entered into God's purpose. Eric never saw his youngest daughter. Uh, but they made a statement about him the kids at the camp. There were so many kids in the camp that he did not have, or that didn't have parents. Oh, I'm sorry. His daughter said this about him. There's so many kids in the camp that didn't have any parents. And he was the influence for them, gave them guidance, helped them to forgive the Japanese. And um, most of them, most all of them went on to do very well, she said. You know, a lot of those kids became missionaries themselves. In fact, one of them, Stephen Metcalf, when he got out, of course, he went back home, but he soon returned. He was 19 years old, and he returned to the Japanese that hated him. He went to evangelize, after the war, the Japanese people. Isn't that incredible? because he was influenced by this man, Eric. And so we're looking at two guys, John the Baptist and Eric Lindo. And um, they both have crowns. 
You know, I was thinking about my high school years and junior high school years. I was into sports. I've got my patch for basketball and, and football and tennis. And, and I got various years of patches. They're somewhere, and I'm sure they're dusty and faded. For a patch, for a temporary prize. But now here these men have something far greater. It says here that all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. You know, that day he was supposed to um, run the hundred. He actually went to a church and they had him preach <laughs> in Paris. And he used this verse for maybe some of you that need to hear this. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. So he preached that mes message uh, and he lived that message. Hallelujah. So here's these two men, John the Baptist, none greater born of men. Eric, he reached back in time quite a ways, but an incredible man that just... <laughs> wanted to bring glory to God's name and all the impression. How many have seen Church of Fire? You people? That's a long movie, two hours. It's kind of boring in some ways, but incredible story about this man. And I went and kind of dived deeper and just to find out about, you know, just all, just more about the whole truth and whatever, and really an incredible man. And yet he died a hundred years ago this next year. No, no, no. No, he lived. He, well, he won that 100 years ago, and he died in 1944. Yeah. We're talking about him today and the legacy that he left. <coughs> Hallelujah. God wants to use our lives. Praise God.